Welcome to this session. It's entitled um, Reforming Fossil Fuel Production Subsidies. I'm Laura Merrill from Global Subsidies Initiative of the International Institute for Sustainable Development. And I'm just, everybody will get into depth with uh, fossil fuel production subsidies in their presentations, but I'll just say that the subsidies to production matter and they're they matter in their existence and in their removal. And it's basically because they're encouraging more production of fossil fuels by making them cheaper, just making them cheaper to extract and to export. And really, combined with consumer subsidies, um, they make it very difficult for us to disentangle ourselves from fossil fuels and from a world where our development's based on carbon. So. How do we extract ourselves from these fossil fuel subsidies and upstream at the producer end? And how do we remove these subsidies to production? Some of the questions that the researchers here have asked are, what are fossil fuel production subsidies upstream to oil, gas, coal, and electricity? How are they different from and interact with consumer subsidies? What impacts do they have on the environment, on society, and on uh, carbon and climate? And how can they be removed? What will they be replaced with, if, ever, if anything? So we're really privileged to have panellists from Russia, from Kenya, from Peru and the US. And I'm going to introduce everyone in one go, and then everyone gets 12 minutes to present. And the first speaker is Yvette Gerasimchuk. She's senior researcher for the Global Subsidies Initiative at IISD. She's a friend and colleague of mine. And she's going to be presenting on unlocking supply and locking in carbon the paradox of determining which fossil fuel subsidies are the worst for the climate. But I think we'll just, we'll start with you and then we'll come back to the others. Okay. Introduction, Lauren. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, fossil fuel subsidies have been long described as a low hanging fruit of climate change mitigation. Low hanging, but prickly. So that's why I have an image of a prickly pear here. Uh, well, low hanging because obviously you don't have any costs when you uh, implement this policy. Uh, on the opposite, you get gains, you save public money, and prickly because of the political economy challenges. Uh, so I'll spare this distinguished audience the definition of fossil fuel subsidy because there are people in this room who have worked on the issue for more than 20 years. Uh, I have worked on this for six years, uh, and I can say from this experience that there is one thing in common between a fossil fuel subsidy and pornography, which is uh, it's sometimes very difficult to define, also legally, but when you see it, you know it. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm doing this presentation together uh, as part of uh, research with uh, Andrea Bassi, so we're working on, and, and together with some people who are also in this room, we're working together on a report which is um, looking at the climate benefits of uh, fossil fuel reform, for fossil fuel sub subsidy reform on the producer end. And um, it's looking at uh, such benefits on a global level. Uh, so what I'm presenting is work in progress is, is the basis of assumptions we are doing also for uh, quantitative modeling. And uh, the two key questions we had, one is what are the worst subsidies uh, for, a cli for the climate? And if these are the same subsidies that sh should be phased out or immediately removed first. Uh, and these are two questions which are quite practical for campaigners, who are looking to award a price to the worst subsidy, for instance, or to policymakers who want to deliver on the uh, commitments under the Paris Agreement. So, um, how much are producer uh, subsidies in the world is something we know quite a bit about, but not everything. So, GSI a few years ago produced a heroic estimate of 100 billion globally. Uh, then the work that has been co-published by OCI and ODI, and where GSI also contributed case studies, estimated just within G20 producer subsidies at 70 billion. 
Uh, and uh, here is a graph. Uh, so for our modeling exercise, we try to aggregate these numbers by few. It's by itself not uh, a trivial exercise because a lot of subsidies are cross-cutting, a lot of them are going to both oil and gas, and it's the same industry effectively, or some of them apply to all fossil fuels and on top of it also to all minerals. So it's, uh, it's a difficult uh, job in itself just to measure, to quantify, and uh, disaggregate fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, we have to make some assumptions, uh, which we have done, for instance, we attributed numbers based on the uh, role of each energy type in the uh, primary energy production in a country. And it shows you more or less that uh, the more capital intensive the industry is, like oil is the most capital intensive industry, the more subsidies it gets. And on the opposite, coal is less capital intensive, so it's showing up as a uh, lower number in terms of subsidies. Uh, the climate impacts of uh, fossil fuel subsidy basically depend on three groups of factors. One is subsidy design, so because subsidies are there for a reason, to stimulate some kind of activity. Uh, there are also unintended uh, uh, impacts of these designs, uh, but this is something the governments can control. Uh, the other group of factors is something governments cannot control, is the physical characteristics of projects, the economics of the projects. And then uh, you can say in rough terms, although I'll do some caveats later about this, so there are, by their nature, projects that are viable only with subsidies, so that's where we're looking at the effects of unlocking them into uh, production. There are projects which are viable even without subsidies, so subsidies arguably have no effect on them. And finally, there are projects which are unviable even with subsidies. And the third group of factors here is everything else, and that's what makes subsidy analysis and analysis of climate uh, consequences of these policies quite difficult, because there is such factor as oil price, for instance, which completely changes economics of projects, there are technologies which we discussed, and they can also influence the economics and competitiveness of different projects in very drastic ways. So there is a lot of uncertainty in general. Uh, so if we talk by design, because this is something the governments can control, we can talk about subsidies that give a signal, very long term, a very strong signal to investors, to companies. And this is why, for instance, uh, may, maybe some of you have heard uh, before uh, G20 a group of insurers came up with uh, a call to the governments to stop fossil fuel subsidies because uh, subsidy gives a very strong signal to uh, the industry to invest in particular type of assets. And this, of course, has implications for risks and insurance costs. So then there are short-term signals, uh, more of temporary nature. Uh, so it's in terms of cost reduction. So the first group of with very long, like beep, beep signal is the, <laughs> the uh, type of uh, subsidies that re reduce fixed uh, costs uh, at the very beginning of the project. So the beep, 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 the short signal, comes uh, if it's uh, the reduction of uh, operation costs and also if consumer subsidies fall in this category because, um, of course, um, from the sales perspective, you can only start selling uh, the product once, once the project becomes operational and it's longer into the future. And finally, arguably, there can be uh, subsidies that give no signal to the industry and I'll come back to this later. So, uh, I already mentioned this time value of subsidies, time value of money. Uh, I'll not go deep into detail on this, but basically capital in the industry is scarce. Uh, investors are very myopic. They are looking at the present value of projects. And this value depends on discounting, and then you have the tyranny of discount. Depending on which discount rate you select, you will get a different value of uh, a dollar in this case, a dollar of subsidy, 
in this present year or 10 years from now or 20 years from now. So uh, very roughly, if you take project life cycle in the industry at 20, 5, 26 years, you take five years for project development, uh, this more immediate costs, and then you have all the costs coming from the fifth year to the 25th, 26 years. So you, you have a difference by a factor of three if it's uh, the discount rate of 10% and it's a uh, uh, factor of two and a half if it's a discount rate of 8%. Uh, so this is the cash flow of the project, um, very typical coming from a textbook of the oil and gas industry, undiscounted in this case. So we have uh, the majority of costs here in the negative coming at the beginning of the cycle, and that's where capital uh, uh, costs are incurred. So uh, that's why basically the strongest single signal which uh, is sent by governments is if companies, for instance, get accelerated appreciation, if they get free infrastructure in terms of pipelines, in terms of roads. Uh, so this type of uh, subsidy will unlock the investment into projects immediately. So the uh, moderate signal, the beep beep signal comes uh, at the later stages when the project starts producing. So it either reduces the operational costs of running the project, for instance, labor costs or um, uh, health insurance costs for coal miners, things like this, or it will increase the uh, revenue at the producing stage, by, for instance, by uh, guaranteeing the market for, uh, for oil, gas, or so coal-fired electricity. Uh, and that's why consumption subsidies can also have a lock-in effect uh, on, um, uh, on high-carbon assets. So, and finally, uh, theoretically, we can say there are projects, uh, there are subsidies which, uh, uh, there are projects which are viable without subsidies, and we at JSA, we have done um, a comparison of two projects, for instance, in the Arctic part of Russia, so uh, with uh, subsidies, one project became commercially viable and uh, went ahead. The other project we looked at, uh, the Prioris Lomne platform, was actually viable even without subsidies. So like in this say, can, you can say, oh, subsidies have now no impact on unlocking new capital, unlocking um, new assets. But in this case, uh, it's, it still increases the revenues of the uh, industry. You can ask questions, what about the opportunity cost? What if other industries received the same level of support? You can ask questions about uh, the reinvestment of these profits, recy recycling of, of this subsidy uh, within companies. Uh, so it's quite um, precarious to say that uh, su some subsidies have no impact. Although in theoretical framework like we are doing for macro modeling, I mean, of course, we have to differentiate. So. Um, there is also a frequently asked question about coal subsidies, are they worse than oil and gas subsidies? Short answer is on production side, no, because everything depends on the characteristic of an individual project, uh, the percentage of costs offset by subsidies, and as we said in the coal sector, the capital costs are lower than in oil and gas. Uh, and then a lot of coal projects are viable even without subsidies. Uh, so which brings us back to, okay, so we have some kind of ranking of subsidies. We can say some of them are possibly worse for the climate than others. Um, so can we just eliminate those and that will be already a step forward. So can we just cut one prickly pear and feel good about it? Uh, so unfortunately, uh, there is leakage effect. And what happens is that once you cut one, uh, the political economy can make subsidies reappear in different places in the same country or in a different country. So in this case, uh, a call for elimination of certain types of subsidies is much weaker than a call for elimination of all types of subsidies. And that brings me con to conclusions that uh, 
If you want to answer this question about which subsidies are the worst, of course the best is to look at project level, but not everyone has this luxury, and then you have to do a trade-off between uh, detailed analysis and assumptions. But prioritization is possibly still not the best um, way forward uh, because of political economy challenges and also because of economics such as leakage, such as fuel substitution. And the best call uh, for those who want to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies to is the call to eliminate all of them to all types of fuel and uh, to both consumption and production. We are releasing the new report uh, around Marrakesh, uh, so and uh, if you have any questions, uh, we are very much looking to your feedback. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Iveta. And now we're going to hear from Kennedy Mveva. He's a research fellow at the African Center for Technology Studies, ACT based in Nairobi in Kenya. Welcome, Kennedy. Thank you, Laura. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'll be making a presentation uh, trying to explain the variation in the fossil fuel subsidy reforms across country because the case has been made for uh, sub fossil fuel subsidy reforms as an important climate policy tool. But uh, we know uh, if we apply it across board, uh, do we find some variations in some countries or not? So to give a brief outline of my presentation, so first uh, have a brief overview of uh, fossil fuel subsidy reforms and uh, how they've been related to climate policy. Secondly, I'll share the research questions and the methods that I used in my analysis. Uh, finally, share the findings and uh, some conclusions from the research. So, why, uh, so the main uh, focus of this research was on looking at uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform as a climate policy tool because uh, there have been many arguments that have been made uh, about uh, using it, for instance, uh, removing fossil fuel subsidies. The G20, for instance, is looking at uh, inefficient fossil fuel subsidy uh, reforms. So the debate is emerging towards adopting it as a climate policy uh, instrument. But um, I think as you've heard from much of the research, a lot of research has focused on the demand side and not much on the, sup uh, on the supply side. So this research will look at supply side, of course, and uh, also look at the conditions which might lead uh, to those reforms uh, taking place. So there's a lot of theorizing, <laughs> so trying to ge generate a broad theory to try to explain. So as all theories, maybe in some cases it might work, in others it might not. So. As stated, the main question was looking at under what conditions can fossil fuel supply side uh, reforms be successful or unsuccessful. So the main focus was uh, looking at time to an event, and time to that event is undertaking a reform. So I uh, developed an original data set, and uh, the main variable that I was looking at, the uh, dependent variable, was how long does it take for a country to undertake a reform. And by reform, I mean developing a national legal framework, whether it's a law or policy that has a direct impact on uh, energy supply and climate policy. And I got a very good uh, data from a database developed by the London School of Economics called the GLOBE Dataset. And it has national legislation, uh, laws and policies that actually have a direct relevance to climate change, whether it's adaptation or mitigation. And uh, most of the national laws and policies that I looked for at the, all the, I think I looked at 95 countries which produce fossil fuels, uh, Many of them had to deal with energy supply, so that was a very convenient, uh, convenient data set to construct the, trying to look at the different factors that would lead to that event happening, which can be a very good proxy to a reform happening related to energy supply and climate policy. And uh, so the main hypothesis that I had is that um, the higher country's preference to climate policy, the higher the probability of, uh, of reforms. And by measuring climate policy preference, I looked at the number of laws in that database that a country has. So if a country has a higher number of laws, then there's a higher probability that it will take, uh, undertake a reform through a law uh, that is related to climate change. So that was a proxy. And I also looked at other factors that have been put forward in literature. And I looked at political, for instance, like um, do the different types of governments or governance have an impact? Is, will reforms be maybe more successful in countries that are democratic or less democratic or in countries that have a federal system or less of a federal system or a centralized system? And I also looked at uh, the economies. Does the size of an economy have an influence on maybe if a country will 
have a higher probability of taking a reform or not. So those were the three main, um, three main uh, hypotheses I was testing. And of course, uh, the statistical analysis I used was a time to event model, trying to measure the time to that event, which is a reform happening. And I took the years 1992 to 2013. 1992, because it was a watershed year for global environmental politics, and many of these uh, issues uh, gained a lot of traction, especially on the international front. And 2013, because most of the data that I got was limited to 2013. It would have been better to go maybe all the way to 2015, but that was a bit uh, challenging. So one of the findings so I took the, from that GLOBE database, uh, the national laws and policies for those 95 uh, fossil fuel producing companies, uh, countries, looking at uh, what was the cumulative number of those laws for those countries over the years. As you can see, there's been quite a steep increase. So some of them might be positive or others negative, but that can show you some activity in the climate preference. And these laws include adaptation and mitigation, but it is a good proxy to look at the preference overall. So this is the main table that had the uh, key findings. So one of the key things was, one, we looked at a growth of greenhouse gas emissions in percentage, like uh, looking from 1992, because it's been argued in literature that uh, a climate policy, uh, if you have a subs uh, fossil fuel subsidy reform as a climate policy tool, it's a cheap or a low cost tool to uh, when you're addressing climate policy issues. So I, we tested that uh, hypothesis and found that there was evidence, although weak, that it can be used uh, as an option, one of the low, uh, low cost tools. I'm not an economist, but that was one of the main arguments. Secondly, the number of climate uh, related laws, national laws, this measures the preference to climate policy. So there's a very strong evidence that uh, countries that have more laws and policies that are related to climate are more likely to enact reforms. So when I look at carbon emissions, to countries that have high emissions maybe consider using uh, reforms as a tool to address those. So the theory suggests that that will happen, although with uh, weak evidence. So one asterisk is for 90% confidence, two asterisk is for 95% confidence, while uh, three asterisk is for 99% confidence. So looking at the politics aspect of it, I didn't find sufficient evidence to uh, that supports that uh, the vi uh, variation in the types of government or go governance actually has a stronger uh, impact on leading to reforms because if you look at, for instance, uh, like um, democratic governments by whatever definition you use, you'll find that there's a lot of representation of many actors and that's where a lot of contestation happens. You'll find people who are very uh, forward-looking uh, pushing for climate policy, but you'll also find the fossil fuel companies represented there. So there's a lot of contestation. Uh, when you also look at autocratic governments, you'd expect uh, most of them, based on uh, literature, have been very antagonistic to climate policy, mo mostly because they rely on uh, fossil fuels. So the probability or chances of them undertaking reforms is almost there. So I didn't find much evidence to support it in this broad theory. So looking at the economy aspect of it, uh, I found evidence that uh, an increase in the size of the economy would increase the probability of the reforms happening because uh, when you look at the GDP, maybe one of the explanations might be that bigger economies are more diversified and maybe they have uh, access to alternative technologies to replace that fossil fuel technology. So that might be one explanation. Um, and it was actually very strong for developing countries. When you look at the uh, figures in the parentheses, they represent developing and developed, least developed countries because I only had uh, from the 95 countries 11 least developing countries, which is least developed countries, which is a pretty small number to some degree. So I combined it with the number of developing countries, which are 52 in the sample. And you can see there's a very strong evidence that an increase in the size of an economy would maybe reflect uh, the diversity or availability of more technologies to, to some degree. And just a note, a number higher than one shows a higher prob probability, like an increase in that factor leading to a higher probability. A number less than one means uh, the opposite. So another interesting thing was uh, looking at official development assistance. So I specifically looked at that variable because in the past, uh, development institutions have been channels for uh, passing through norms, different norms of uh, development, sustainability, etc. So I looked at the percentage of a, of a country's income that comes from ODA, and um, it was very interesting to find that an increase in ODA uh, leads to a higher probability. Maybe it's because of 
the channeling through norms and the influence and leverage that those development uh, institutions or the, rather those aid institutions have, especially on developing and least developed countries. And finally, I looked at the fossil fuel rents uh, as a percentage of the income a country gets. And you can see there's a strong, there's a significant evidence, especially for developing countries that the more they rely on fossil fuels uh, for their income, the less likely they are to form, uh, to undertake uh, reforms. So moving on uh, to the half that uh, answers to the question, first question that I posed, you can see the in blue is a combination of the developing and least developed countries, and in green is uh, developed countries, and you can see Developed countries are exiting from the from the sample really fast because that shows like they're making a reform and leaving. So, and so developed countries actually have a higher probability of undertaking these reforms than developing and least developed countries. And you can see this, for example, through the OECD, through the 20. They are the ones who are sort of like the fast movers in these issues. So we'd sort of expect that. So finally. Um, Back to the question, so the question we looked at under what conditions can supply side fossil fuel subsidy reforms be successful or unsuccessful. And my broad theory suggests that countries with a higher preference for climate policy are more, more likely to undertake reforms. Secondly, the type of government does not have a major significant impact on whether reforms will happen or not. And thirdly, countries with bigger economies are more likely to undertake reforms. So putting this in the broader context of the discussions today, it brings about uh, the question like one, there are countries which depend on these fossil fuels, but if you tell them to live in the ground, what is the alternative? Secondly, the same same countries have very ambitious climate plans, especially in the INDCs. How do they reconcile the two? So it opens up again uh, the issues that were debated before. How do you have a just transition? How do you have an equitable transition? Because uh, this entire like uh, the processes uh, varies across different country groups. So that is the main. Um, presentation of the theory. Of course, there are many other interesting variables that could be considered, but uh, just to test the broad ideas, uh, these were the ones that were considered in the study. Okay, thank you, Kennedy. Next up is Sue Clary, uh, Aradio Guterres. She is um, from the Environment Ministry of Peru, from Peru, with Peru, and she's going to be talking about measuring the impacts of eliminating subsidies and assigning taxes to energy products in Mexico through a general equilibrium model. Better. Thanks. Well, I'm going to present one of the results of my PhD dissertation that was about the uh, Mexico situation, about avoiding subsidies, specific production subsidies, and also carbon tax and, tra and transport tax. Uh, for Mexico, it's important to be one of the countries that develop different climate policies and activities about mitigation and adaptation of climate change. Mm, also, we have a climate change law with an aspirational goal to reduce emissions 30% for 2020. So we have the aspirational goals, but how we are going to develop these activities or how we are going to reduce emissions. So they propose different tools, MRV system, national emission register, that it's a specific difference in the case that they're just going to know about the emissions and they are not going to do transactions during, uh, or a cap and trade in the register. So the other part is we already have energetic reform. We are trying to change to having just one oil company to different companies, private sector, investing in oil and gas. Then a fiscal reform when we include a carbon tax. So this is the national context. Also this year, we ratified the Paris Agreement. So we have more commitments to follow in the next year. So the idea is to know what about production subsidies. These are not important at all because most of us think about the consumption subsidies. These are bigger, these are more important for us, and the production subsidies are also important in this case. I develop a general equilibrium model uh, considering the full economy. We also consider 10 different types of consumers, and we are not considering the benefits of emission reductions that are the result of avoiding this subsidies. Mm. 
Another thing that is important of this model is that allow us to compare between different sectors and also between different policies. Most of the time we have specific models for each sector or for each policy, and in this case the model allows us to compare the different sectors and policies with the same database. So I consider the sectors that are related to oil, gas, and electricity. The producer sectors and also the sectors that put different input for their activities. Uh, well, I developed two different models. One is a static model. I'm just going to present some of the results. <laughs> and why it's important for us to consider the production subsidies. Uh, if we can see, these are the amount of the production subsidies and these are the consumption subsidies. So it's a small quantity compared between both, but also this amount are the same that some social programs in Mexico. And it's important to consider that we need to invest more in education and health, so or even in poverty programs. So these are not just little quantities, are important for us if we want to invest in other programs that help the country. So I, the results about eliminating these subsidies, we have the results in three different variables. These are emission reductions. These are the additional income to the government. And here is the um, welfare of the consumer considering equivalent variation. So just the electricity has a significant impact if we avoid the subsidy. It's less than the 1%, but it's the more important in the emission reductions also in the government income. And if we consider the part of the consumer welfare, we have just, when we avoid all subsidies, the 50, 0.50%. So it's not a big amount, the impact that we have, and also we can use that money to another programs or other activities. The other path was to assigning taxes in two different points. One is trying to simulate the carbon tax, that it's the different for each kind of fuel, considering the content of carbon. And our transport tax, that it's just for the products that we transfer from another cities to the capitals to provide food or different vegetables, anything. So mm, the government income increase in the carbon tax more than the road transport tax. And <coughs> also, when we consider the consumer welfare, it's bigger the impact with the carbon tax than the transport. The important thing here is to consider that the lower the sales have more impact with the carbon tax than the difference between the transport, the first sale to the last one. So. The carbon tax sometimes we consider that it's better because you punish the people who use their car. And in the Mexico case, not exactly that. The people who don't have a car use public transport and everything, and it's expensive for them if we assign a carbon tax and a, another kind of taxes. So uh, this is the part of the static model. And also, we develop a dynamic model considering just the different scenarios about taxes <laughs> in a period of 10 years. This is the result for the whole period in the principal variables that are emission reductions, government income, and welfare. So uh, first, if we assign uh, taxes from 2% to 10%, we don't have a big emission reductions or bigger difference between them. But if we want to have uh, important emission reductions, like 3% is when we assign a 30% tax, carbon tax. So that's the first one. But also the impact to the welfare is 3.5. So we have to consider what is better or worst. Also the uh, government income increased just around 2% and this gave us the opportunity to make transferences to the first five deciles of the population. So 
Maybe it's an option to consider high taxes and also to make transference to a population. It's one option. And well, the general results about the different with it shows the same. No, the more important thing is uh, the government <coughs> the government income increase more when we have a bigger tax. Uh, considering the consumable worker, it's a bigger impact for them if we remove the gas subsidy and not the other subsidies. Uh, and the emissions will also a tax on oil production has the better impact in reduction emissions. Well, some reflections for us is that if we want to reduce emissions, we have to consider many factors. It's not just a fiscal policy or an energetic reform that we need. Uh, <laughs> Mexico is an oil dependent country, so we have to change a little bit our energetic metrics. So also we can invest the amount that we have with taxes or the amount we have without eliminate subsidies to a new technologies, also renewable energies, or the other thing that is important is that the carbon tax has to be focused to something to do. It's not just another new tax that we can use for all the things that we use, like health or everything. We have to focus that amount in specific activities. So that's the only way we are going to go to our aspirational goals of 30%. So that's all. Thanks. So please welcome Doug Coplow, founder of EarthTrack, um, who, who's come and who will be talking about fossil fuel subsidy reform in the United States, impediments and opportunities. Thank you, Doug. Thanks very much. Um, it's nice to be here. I want to cover three things. Um, one, a little bit of discussion of the history of fossil fuel subsidy reform in the U.S. and go a little bit into the impediments um, that we faced and some ideas for addressing them. And then also to introduce some work that I've been working on with SEI that's trying to unroll the subsidies at the field level and see how it changes the investment returns. And we're fortunate that we have uh, Mike Lazarus, Pete Erickson, and Adrian down in the audience. So if there are questions that come up, I can't answer. They're here to help. So we've been dealing with this question for a long time. This political cartoon is actually from 1889. The fat guys in the background are actually money bags for big industries at that time. Um, there was a big concern that they were intervening with the Congress, uh, getting control of government to direct money to the individual uh, sectors, and, and keeping the public out, which is pretty much what happens with oil subsidies. A lot of these industries have gone by the wayside, but the ones with yellow arrows, we've got coal, oil and gas, um, they're still around. So that's 1889. This here is 1927. Okay, so one of the big first tax breaks for oil and gas in the United States came in in 1924 or 1925. It was a percentage depletion allowance that allowed firms to deduct from their taxes more than they actually invested in, in their oil wells. And only a couple years later, we had the Division of Investigation of the Joint Committee on Taxation kicking in with the report, trying to assess why was this happening, was it fair, was there a, any basis for these subsidies, and in fact, there's a great, a great quote down here from the senator who sponsored the legislation acknowledging, no, there wasn't such a, uh, an economic basis for it. In fact, they plucked 27.5% out of the air because it was big and they wanted a lot of benefits, but also because it seemed scientific because it was so precise. So this type of uh, manipulation of facts, I think, is something that anybody who tries to deal with subsidy reform uh, addresses on a regular basis. This isn't to say that we haven't made improvements in the United States. We actually have. On tax and tax expenditures, 1974, that's quite a while ago, we made federal reporting of tax expenditures mandatory. This was actually picked up over time by most states in the country. The problem was the states don't always assess it in exactly the same way, but they were assessing it, and that's a good thing. And in fact, the Government Accounting Standards Board has now issued a formal rulemaking on tax abatement disclosures, which will kick in next year. So we will have standardized reporting required for all levels, levels of government in the United States. So that's a big improvement. Credit subsidy reporting, uh, 
Again, we started kind of early 1991, uh, federal efforts to have credit reporting in the budget uh, kicked in. Uh, it was complicated. The states really haven't stepped up in this area. And even the federal metrics are not very good. So they ignore the cost of administering the credit programs. But most importantly, they benchmark it against the Treasury's cost of borrowing, which is very low risk capital. And what they should be doing is benchmarking against the riskiness of the ventures that the government is supporting. So a lot of room for improvement there. State-owned enterprises, we've actually got some of them in the United States, not as many as other countries um, in the energy sector, but we do have things like the power marketing administrations. When there are discrete commercial activities by government-owned entities, we've got pretty good rules. So we require standard financial reporting. It has to be independently audited. Those audits are made public. There is accountability. But there's a lot of blurry lines of government involvement. So we have uh, the, the federal government maintaining the inland waterways, and it just so happens that 50 percent or more of the tonnage that moves through the inland waterways is oil and coal. Um, we have a strategic petroleum reserve, which is billions of dollars of stockpiled oil. These are blurrier issues of state-owned enterprises, and the data is pretty bad. They don't do the accounting properly, and therefore we often don't know how much we're spending to provide these goods and services to the fossil fuel sector. There are some positive trends in the U.S. for sure. Um, Ten years ago, it was kind of the line agencies, Environmental Protection Agency, Department of Energy, that were focused on energy subsidies kind of from the policy angle. Today it's very much coming from the Treasury and the President. This is a pattern that I've also seen happening in other countries. Um, the Obama administration put in fossil fuel subsidy reforms in most of its budgets. None of them got through, but they were putting them in. We're seeing growing data, OECD, other international agencies, um, NGOs, some of them are here, uh, oil change, overseas development, are doing a lot of great work to have more frequent reporting, broader coverage of countries, broader coverage of the U.S., and that's been a great help. And even the G20 is moving a little bit, a little bit more than I thought it was going to. We'll have to see how that plays out. Um, but 10 years ago or 15 years ago, when you talked about the importance of removing fossil fuel subsidies, there was sometimes a question as to whether people thought it was important. But now it's very broadly viewed as a critical plank of any type of greenhouse gas reduction strategy. And I think that's a very positive improvement. Yet when I polled my colleagues on the issue of how we're doing with subsidy reform in the U.S., I got universally negative responses. I mean, things like, you got me, what reforms? Or inquiring wise, want to know. I can't remember the last time the U.S. successfully reformed a fossil fuel subsidy. So this is, uh, you know, not optimistic stuff. And it's kind of in line with my view of the situation as well. We've seen some narrowing over time of subsidies to oil and gas, some reduction in the levels they can get, some restrictions on international operations, or the largest companies can't tap into everything. But even in the very broad-based tax reform of Act of 1986, most of the oil and gas subsidies survived when lots of other things were cut. And the industry is very active and is always looking for more. So we see um, refinery expensing, uh, the use of the IRS private letter ruling process to expand their ability to use master limited partnerships to escape corporate taxation. We've seen royalty gifts on the Gulf of Mexico. Big push now to have large subsidies for carbon ca capture and sequestration in the U.S., even though most of the captured CO2 is going to be re-injected into oil and gas wells to pull out more oil and gas. So this is a very challenging process. We've seen more success on the administrative front with leasing and royalty modifications, regulatory improvements, particularly following accidents. Um, and we've seen a couple of cases where people have figured out how to use uh, tax subsidies in interesting ways, and the cost ballooned to billions of dollars, and then Congress was actually embarrassed and got rid of it. But these are far and few between. Part of the problem, I think, is numerical. So in the lower left corner is a little smiley face. That's right at the zero. <laughs> API is the American Petroleum Institute, which is the largest trade association in the U.S., and according to them, there are no subsidies to oil and gas. The official <laughs> estimates are uh, EIA and Treasury, a little bit higher. Then we've got OECD's work and OCI higher still. But there's a pretty big spread here. So clearly people are using different definitions. 
uh, in what they're picking up. And we can see that uh, as well, that when you break out these numbers by type of intervention, that the spending and tax expenditure bars over the left here, so grants and tax breaks, is a vast majority about what we're picking up. If that were the only thing that the fossil fuel sector was getting, fine. But there's all these other ways that governments transfer value to private industry that we're simply not measuring very well. And I think one of the challenges that we face going forward is how do we start picking up these things so we can see the full picture of what's going on. This is just another uh, view of that same issue here with the concentration of direct spending and tax expenditures. Another important lesson, I think, is the importance of subnational subsidies. So OECD has done tremendous work. Jahan back there knows the suffering that it took to get it. Um, to go through all the states and provinces to try and tease out what's going on at these lower levels of government. It turns out it's pretty important. In the U.S., about half of the measured benefits are at the subnational level. And we need to do a, a, good, a better job making sure we build that out. Why are we having these struggles? Well, clearly the power of the groups we're up against is a big issue here. Um, our friends, the American Petroleum Institute, have a, a budget of almost $250 million a year that, uh, that dwarfs even some of the largest uh, environmental groups in, in the United States. So, you know, oil change is doing tremendous work, uh, improving transparency here, but easily outspent by the big guys. And they're not, the trade associations like API really aren't interested in, in the earning, it's a, it's a political organization, and this is their head tax policy guy basically coming out and saying, oh, these things that we get, everybody gets them, they're not really subsidies, and it takes a lot of work to try and contest that process on an ongoing basis. Another important uh, point is that we sometimes focus on subsidies that are specifically targeted at oil and gas, but the, the, the guideline here needs to be subsidies flow to power. And if you're in a part of a country where the fossil fuel industry happens to be pow powerful, you've got to look at everything. This is a, a review I did in, uh, of uh, Hurricane Katrina tax-exempt bonds. Okay, Hurricane Katrina hit the southeast United States. It wiped out um, large parts of a couple of states. Congress put through a whole bunch of money to help them rebuild. Nearly two-thirds of those bonds were captured by the fossil fuel industry. And that's a great indication of the challenges that we face and the importance of not narrowing what you look at too much. And now I want to shift to some of the work that um, I've been doing with SEI. Caveat, these are all marked draft. Why are we coming up with draft stuff at this meeting? Number one, because it's cool. <laughs> we, we want to talk about it. Number two, because we actually welcome input from, from you guys. So if you see things, if you see ways you'd like us to present the data differently, um, it, we, we would welcome that input. So what we did here is we took uh, data at the project level on the projected production levels and economics of oil and gas fields um, around the country, concentrating in a, in a number of uh, basins. And then we synthesized removing the subsidies to see how it affected the rate of return. And the baseline rate of return on average was about 7.7%. Over here is the uh, the intangible credit, which is widely viewed as the most significant subsidy to oil and gas. But what we discovered is there's some little stuff that no one pays attention to that actually matters quite a bit. The yellow bar in the middle is actually the excess road damage that heavy fracking trucks do to the roads in Texas. And it turns out Texas cares about this. They've done some pretty detailed studies. It's about $4 billion per year. So when we run it through our models, it increases the baseline IRR by about 1.9 percentage points, which is a boost of about 25%. So this is, this is a big deal. And again, it illustrates the need to go to the subnational level and to look carefully before concluding that there's no problem. This is a, a great map um, that shows the field by field level data, where the blue dotted lines on the bottom are what the return is on these fields with no subsidies. The fat orange dots, I'm sorry, it's a little hard to see, are where are the field, the projects where they went above their hurdle rate because of the subsidies. So I've kind of tagged these things, the leakage zone, which is over to the left, projects where public money is going in and it didn't really make a difference in the outcome, so it's sort of largely leaking away to the people who own the fields 
or own the resources. And what I call the abetment zone, see carbon abatement, carbon abetment. It's not, um, it's not actually trademark, but I, I, I just, I just want to say if it catches on, you heard it here first. Uh, so this is an example where taxpayer money is unlocking greenhouse gas emissions, uh, potentially significant greenhouse gas emissions that otherwise would have stayed in the ground without the subsidies. Um, so you can see that it's sensitive to the price. The more expensive the oil is, the less important subsidies are. But along the boundaries of today's price is about $50 per, oil, uh, per barrel of oil, roughly half of the new oil that's not producing is dependent on subsidies. So this is a big deal. Um, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> so this, this chart's a little bit less beautiful, but it's basically, it's basically saying the same thing. So 47% across the U.S. is subsidy dependent. We tried to ballpark what that might mean in terms of uh, carbon emissions. About nine gigatons of CO2 um, within the U.S. Uh, less, obviously, if you look at the net reduction because there's some uh, foreign oil that will flow in as you start removing these subsidies. But still, it's a significant lever point to look at when we're trying to deal with uh, very difficult challenges on climate change. So finally, you know, where do we need to go? We got to fill in the data. We've got to have the data more quickly um, so that we can be responsive to the policy debates, be more uh, relevant in decisions as they're being made, uh, and ensure that we have fiscal alignment with our environmental goals. And also this idea of policy contestability. So we always hear justifications for existing subsidies Let's say it's supporting development, it's supporting jobs. A lot of times there's lots of ways to bring jobs or to bring development to regions. You need to be able to come to bear more quickly and say, you're choosing a pathway of subsidies to energy that's causing all these problems, uh, but actually there's all these other things you can do instead. Your choice for your state, for your region, or for your country. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thank you, Doug. I mean, those are all really interesting presentations dealing with um, policy um, with Mexico. I saw in their NDC, their Nationally Determined Contribution, they've included energy sector reforms, actually, and there has been reform recently. And uh, all the, that, that huge figure from Doug there linked to, uh, to, to oil and uh, subsidy-dependent oil, which is extraordinary. Um, there, and the fact that uh, you, your research didn't find so much, Kennedy, all these uh, very strong links, but um, one of the points that came out from, uh, from one of the other uh, presentations around um, government revenue savings and uh, sort of social impacts, and then the final third thing sort of being this co-benefit of uh, emissions. So perhaps it's not just about climate policy and it's a bigger picture around um, government policy and so on and so forth. But we should open this up to the floor and take questions and let's, uh, let's take four to start with, okay? Up here. Yeah, thank you, Henri Weisman from IDRI. Just to follow up on what you just said, because uh, and, uh, this is a question to uh, Kennedy, but that echoes a lot, for example, with your last, very last work, Doug. Um, your starting point, your, I mean, assumption is that there is a direct connection between climate change and reform of uh, subsidies, which I'm not completely convinced of. I'm not convinced that climate change is the primary reason for reforms of subsidies, which, I mean, what, what we see, there are some examples, like what happens in Indonesia, for example, uh, where the main reason for reforming subsidies is that it's regressive. Just, it's not an efficient way to reduce the inequalities just because the richest consume more and so benefit more from the subsidies. And when under a constrained budget, it's a very inefficient way for the governments to use these resources to reduce what is their main concern, which is inequalities. And then the emission reductions is obviously a benefit of that, but I'm not sure that it's a primary reason for the governments to take that into consideration. So to go to your analysis, I wonder whether you could reframe it to start differently with not climate change as an entry point, uh, 
but some other dimensions at least that you could include in your uh, regressions in order to take that into account. I'm Fernando Tudela from, uh, from Mexico, the, the Center for Global Change. And building upon the last presentation, I, I think we have a fundamental difficulty there because we, we are not just measuring in different ways, but we are measuring different things when, when speaking about uh, subsidies. And there seems to be a lack of symmetry in the positive taxation, the taxes, we, we all know a tax when we see one, uh, it's, it's legally framed in, in a way, uh, but uh, there is a lack of definition in terms of uh, what the subsidy is. And even, well, we, we saw the, the, the data, G70, G7, G20, uh, APEC, uh, OECD, IMF, you name it, they, they have all said that uh, we have to phase out the subsidies. And nothing much has happened, and uh, this is an understatement. But even if you consider um, IA, National Energy Agency and uh, OECD, which are sister organizations, they have different ways of measuring subsidies. IEA is focusing on the difference between the domestic price and the international price, a very simple way of uh, defining subsidies, although uh, extremely restrictive in the extent and while OECD is uh, achieving some kind of bottom-up consideration of different programs that may help uh, production of fossil fuels, um, much more... Can you go to the question the, to the panel? And then the question can... of the panel is, are, are we ready for a discussion on uh, achieving a shared definition of subsidies so that we can measure the, the subsidies in, in a harmonized way across countries? Is it feasible? Good question. Do, would it make sense in the sense that um, we, we cannot manage what we cannot measure? Yeah. And uh, do you think, collectively, the panel, uh, we, we can achieve that, a common definition of what the subsidy is? Is there any other questions in the audience? Okay, Johan. Um, it's more comments to uh, <laughs> a response to what we just said. Um, uh, just to say that I think um, people tend to underestimate the extent to which there's agreement on definitions. Um, at first, most countries are signatories to the WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, where Article 1 has a definition. So most countries have signed off on the definition of a subsidy. And secondly, um, in the context of the G20 peer reviews, the countries that participate have signed on in terms of references that define a subsidy and it's pretty close to WTO definition. So, um, and last, just to say that the IEA and OECD numbers are actually compatible. They measure different things, but you can add them up. They just that IEA focuses on developing emerging countries and, and price-driven subsidies, and the OECD measures other things, the fiscal cost in developed countries mostly. So it's not incompatible. And the two organizations actually working together. The IEA doesn't have a the price gap method of the IA is not a definition, it's a method. Uh, they have a definition that is actually broader and encompasses all sorts of budgetary transfers and tax breaks. Uh, Jahan didn't introduce himself, but that's Jahan Salvage at OECD, and he's done a lot of the work in building the OECD's data set and working on the uh, G20 stuff, so he knows what he's talking about. So do you, do you want to go to some of the questions then? Do you want to... Are there any more? Should we take any more? Okay, Alex, go for it. So I was going to say something about definitions, but I feel like I feel like we've got it covered. Um, and you know, my counter question, actually, to, to your question is, 
Um, does it matter if we have complete harmonization and agreement on definitions, or, or can we proceed with trying to achieve reform without that? Uh, but the real question that I'm going to ask, since I think that's been covered already, um, is I'm always interested in, because Oil Change International, we do some analytical work on subsidies uh, as well as uh, campaigning and advocacy work around subsidies. Um, and I, I, you know, a couple of you on the panel I know and a couple of you I don't, but I'm very keen uh, from the perspective of people who do a lot more sort of research focused and analytical work on the issue is, you know, wh what's the upshot of your analysis for actually achieving change in the world in terms of advocacy and campaigning? Um, and I know that's something that is the job of the campaigning community to some degree to figure out, but I'm always interested to hear the insights of people who are doing deep analytical and scholarly work on this. Uh, about you know what what's the missing piece if we don't have a lot of reform that's happened so far from your perspective from where you sit what do you think is is missing? Okay, let's let's go to the panel and we'll have time to get come back and so save your questions. It's coming back. So I think I'll take the first question, which was a very interesting question about uh, like the assumption I used. Uh, just to be clear, I did not assume uh, like direct causation between uh, like the reforms being used specially for climate policies, but it was because the theory it was more of hypo uh, hypothesizing because uh, it has been put forward, for instance, that it can lead, maybe that's not the primary reason in most cases why like, you, know, you have the reforms for climate policy, but it has been identified as a tool. So the major assumption was, suppose it was used as a tool, what conditions you know, would uh, lead it to, to be successful or not. So there's a big trade-off because it's a general theory that looks across a number of countries. So in, my, in some cases it might hold, in some it might not. But I think what is most important maybe is now getting country-specific case studies which give us now the causal reasons or the causal links uh, exactly to that. But this was more of getting a pro an approximation of if it was a, used as a climate policy instrument. So I think it doesn't have like a strong direct link because it's very difficult to establish that unless you get very empirical like country or sub-national uh, case studies to back that up. So there are a couple of questions uh, here. First, I see subsidy reform as beneficial for many reasons, one of which is that it helps align your price signals with concerns over climate change. But I also don't see it as the major reason to reform subsidies. It's an important benefit of it. Um, in terms of the definitions, um, subsidies go along a continuum. So in, in the center, you have government grants. It's a cash transfer from one party in the state to one private entity. There's really no uh, definitional problems. It's easier to measure. As you start going to the more complicated transfer mechanisms, uh, it becomes more difficult because you need to have a baseline condition that you're comparing it to in order to assess the subsidies. Sometimes those baseline conditions will vary from country to country. But I certainly believe you can make important progress without full consensus on, on those. Um, it's also quite important to recognize that probably half of the definitional problems people raise are politically driven, um, that they are trying to basically inject funding into process in order to slow things down because when you have information out there it makes it harder for them to fend what they're getting and sometimes what they're getting is a lot. Um, so I think definitionally we've, we're certainly workable um, in some of the margins in terms of tax expenditures across countries or benchmarking credit subsidies or uh, indemnification and insurance uh, that's an area where much uh, where there can be improvements and there's a lot of missing data um, but I think we're doing okay. Uh, well, I started uh, in my presentation with saying that I don't think the discussion of uh, definition is useful. Moreover, um, uh, subsidy definition is being discussed when people basically want to sidetrack the conversation, as Doug said, for political reasons. And that's exactly some countries, what some countries are doing in G20. Uh, so, and that's why it got stuck. But at the same time, I think one of the major lessons learned is that uh, reform happens at the national level, uh, not necessarily at the global level. I mean, if you want to play to the gallery for domestic purposes, uh, for countries like US, it may work, like you're not the only one who is doing the reform. But in practice, all reform always happens at the national level for reasons not related mostly uh, to, uh, to climate change mostly related to budgetary constraints, of course. 
Um, and the other um, um, upshot of, of, of the research is basically that if we are looking at supply side um, um, mitigation measures, it's about uh, the lock-in of high carbon assets over the long term. And uh, in this respect, it doesn't matter if it's production subsidy or consumption subsidy. They, uh, they should be viewed together and dealt with together. And um, again, the opponents of this approach, the opponents of subsidy reform would do exactly what uh, the Romans did or the British Empire did. So they will divide and start arguing about uh, details. So I think for campaigning organizations, it's important just to make a very strong uh, blanket statements about all types of subsidies. Well, I think that we have to think outside the box. It's not just that subsidies important for climate change, are important for different sectors, affect the prices, affect the market. So, and in developing countries, the climate change is not the only problem we have. So, uh, avoiding subsidies can help to other problems, to the economy, to the market, to the prices. So, maybe it's important to develop policies considering different aspects to be more rentable for the people talking about poverty or markets and not just climate change. More questions? Radak, uh, just behind you, and then one at the top. Hi, Radek Stefanski from the University of St. Andrews and the Oxford Center for the Analysis of Resource-Rich Economy. Sorry for that. For. Um, so I, I just wanted to ask you, maybe Doug, you might know about this a little bit more. Um, you know, measuring fossil fuel subsidies is just one type. You know, that's just one type of subsidy. Is there um, some mechanism around the world in the United States that measures other types of subsidies? And that might help us also understand you know, whether subsidies like that are big potatoes or small potatoes, you know. So sure, we're subsidizing fossil fuels a lot, but maybe we're subsidizing other stuff as well. And so it'd be interesting to compare. Hi, I'm uh, Neil McCulloch from myself, I'm an independent consultant. Um, uh, I wanted to qu ask a quick question to Kennedy. I missed your definition of what fossil fuel subsidy reform actually entailed. And, and so, therefore, it was difficult to interpret your, <clears throat> your um, odds ratio results. But the most peculiar result from your odds ratio was that it seems that uh, the provision of overseas development assistance gave rise to a 90% reduction in the chance of a fossil fuel subsidy reform. Uh, maybe I misinterpreted your graph, but uh, that would be surprising and interesting, and there must be a story behind that. Um, I also uh, I had a second question for the whole panel, which was really to do with what are the sort of circumstances that give rise to um, fossil fuel subsidy reform? I think it would be fair to say, I'm a development economist, and I think it would be fair to say that climate change does not feature highly at all in the thinking of most fossil fuel subsidy reforms. I've lived for eight years in Indonesia and was heavily involved in the analysis around the Indonesian fossil fuel subsidy reform, and I assure you that no one mentioned climate change as the reason for doing it. Um, one of the reasons that uh, these things get done is because of fiscal crisis. Um, uh, the initial discussions about the fossil fuel subsidy reform in Indonesia happened under the SBY presidency when they were spending 30% of their budget on fossil fuel subsidies and they realized that that really wasn't sustainable. Um, other reasons might be because you wish to shift resources into the things that you like. For example, Jokowi's um, fossil fuel subsidy reforms are primarily because he needed a mechanism for funding his health card and education card reforms, which were key platforms, uh, uh, key components of his political platform. So I'm wondering whether you can give some hints as to the sorts of things that actually drive fossil fuel subsidy reform when it does actually happen. The top, yeah. Hi, Franz Matzner with NRDC in the US. And um, I'm really intrigued by how we mix the campaign element of this. And so, as a campaigner in the US, um, just one observation is one of the reasons we don't make the progress is because subsidies make a great political weapon, but we've, and so both sides use them. And we mix and match our terminology of this. You know, one person's subsidy is another person's incentive. Um, so I do think that the definitional aspect of this matters to some degree because you know, we run into this problem a lot. Like it's a subsidy when it's going to something you don't like. In our case, fossil fuels, and it's an incentive when it's going to wind and solar. Um, and 
and we don't have like a, a great way to distinguish those pieces. Um, and both sides like to use that as a, as a political weapon, but nobody really wants to do the forms because the scale of the money at stake that's being identified is usually too small, at least in the US, to actually pay for the thing that they want. So it becomes just a horse trading. Um, and so, I'm, I, so putting that together as an observation, I'd love to get some advice from the panelists on how we could distinguish incentives from subsidies and also find a way to kind of as a community have a bigger number to play with because the bigger the number, the more, you know, that's been the problem. The president, Obama identifies $4 billion and it sounds like a lot of money, but it doesn't pay for healthcare reform. It doesn't pay for the big ticket items. So how can we make that number as big as possible and distinguish it from the good stuff? And one from Laurie, and then we'll, oh, sorry, yeah. And one down here. Okay, Sheila, Laurie, Sheila, that's two ODI, and then one from down here, and then we'll stop. Yeah, We've so got it's, time. So it's Laurie from ODI, thank you very much for your interesting presentations. But it has to be quick. Yes. Um, we don't have much so time. For me, fossil fuel subsidies, both to production and consumption, really raise questions about the distribution of the benefits and cost of fossil fuel production activities, um, and also about the, um, who carries the risks of investing in these industries. And um, I think that in many countries that are, there are still very big misperceptions around this. Uh, for example, in the UK, um, the government is now in providing a net subsidy to the industry, um, while um, a lot of the or a big share of the po population still uh, thinks that it's a, a big source of government revenue. So, how do we actually shift the, the narrative? Um, how do we uh, make sure that there is a, that, that we get a wider understanding of, of the distribution of costs and benefits of um, fossil fuel production and consumption? Sorry, back to back ODI. <laughs> Sheila Whitley, I'm with the Overseas Development Institute. Um, I'm very quickly, I'm wondering if actually um, sort of shooting myself in the foot as I've started to work almost exclusively on fossil fuel subsidy reform, um, if actually in the case of countries where climate is important, that we may have leapfrogging over subsidy reform where it becomes much more of a focus on moratoriums, climate tests, other tactics to actually um, undercut fossil fuel production that might make um, the subsidy fights uh, irrelevant in the context of, of climate. And then down here. Did you, oh, I misunderstood perhaps, did you consider um, among other things prices and uh, um, interest rates? I didn't see interest rates. If not, do you think that it will change the calculation of the present value of? And for so, do you think that the reduction in uh, subsidies, so-called subsidies, will help in the reform? We see that perhaps the reduction of uh, subsidies will be compensated with reduction in taxes and royalties. So go for it. Who wants to start? Do we need a mic down there? Do you have a mic? Okay. All right, there's, there's a lot of stuff out here, so I'll, I'm going to do my best to, to respond. I, I think there's some themes that I was hearing. So, um, there are measures for all types of subsidies. That was your question. And indeed, you want to do that. You want your fiscal system. You want your treasury. You want an integrated budget that's looking at the ways government is using its power to redistribute resources, and you want to be able to measure it. So tax expenditures are credit stuff that cuts across sectors. It's not granular enough. You can't see which sector. You can't see which projects. That would be a huge improvement. Um, but that relates to the big number issue because subsidies to some other industries also have pretty negative effects, also contribute to climate change. And if you could get an integrated metric of the subsidies to energy plus energy intensive industries, um, it would be quite useful. I disagree with this whole question of differentiating incentives and subsidies. I think it's not a useful discussion. Wind and solar get subsidies. Those subsidies are put in place for a particular reason, just like the subsidies to oil and gas were put in place 100 years ago for a particular reason. And 
I, you know, then everybody says, well, you know, you're treating this sector differently than that sector. It's fine to just say, I believe this group should be subsidized and here are the reasons and then fight that battle. Um, and I think you're going to end up in a better place than trying to pretending that somehow um, you're, you're different. Um, in terms of this moratorium and spending cuts, I think it's an interesting strategy. When you start winning all those battles, maybe you can step back on the subsidy front. Um, one concern I have is that moratoria work best for publicly owned resources and lots of production is on private lands. I'm also concerned that if you have a state-owned energy company, it's going to be very difficult to get that state to cap down on your supply. Um, so should be pursued, uh, could be useful, uh, but I would continue to work on, on both fronts. So in general, fossil fuel subsidy reform is, of course, it's not uh, by itself a game changer. So it should be viewed as a part of a suite of policies, which also include mitigation measures for uh, the losers of this reform, which include green economy transition, which include other sources of revenue for the government, not just the fossil fuel industry. So it's, it's quite a big package of measures. Uh, and the beauty of fossil fuel subsidy reform is that it's self-sufficient in itself in the sense that if you implement it, you save money. So you don't need climate change, you don't need other arguments, and that's what has worked uh, in the past. So um, the narrative, uh, this is uh, Radek to your question, the narrative about fossil fuel subsidies has been historically very strongly influenced by agricultural subsidies. Uh, and the definition we use within the WTO has been designed with other industries in mind. So agricultural subsidies are not a very inspiring example, but we can possibly um, learn something from them. And it's, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, billions and billions of dollars as well. Um, so with, um, with your question with interest rates. So there is a very wonky aspect of fossil fuel subsidies, which is the concessional element of credit support and public finance. It's very difficult to measure. Um, there are conceptual approaches how you can do it, but um, yes, companies, uh, especially state-owned enterprises, very often get um, access to cheaper finance. So, um, and um, this is an area where uh, we can hopefully uh, do more research, bring more transparency. Of course, this will increase the number, and talking about increasing the number, I think uh, the best way is to treat both production and consumption subsidies together, but there is a danger, a danger of um, increasing the number uh, to the level where it stops making sense. And unfortunately, this is some of the criticism of the IMF estimates that includes um, externalities into uh, their definition. It's not like it's devoid of sense, but it's not uh, money that you can uh, reallocate for other purposes. So in this sense, getting a bigger number can shoot itself in the foot. So we have to be careful about this. Well, uh, considering that in Mexico, the company who produce oil and electricity are a national company. So when they give the subsidy, they are going the subsidy to their own companies. No, it's just a transfer of the, well, they sell the input in a low price. So that's a big problem. And maybe the first impacts are going to pass when the ref electric reform begins and the activities because the private companies, I'm not really sure that they agree to sell their inputs in low prices. So that will be very interesting to analyze the first oil prices that they sell to the other companies and the impact in electricity prices. So I think that's the most important impact. Just for Kennedy. Okay, so I think I'll respond to the very interesting question on f how I defined uh, a policy, a fossil fuel subsidy reform taking place. So f my conceptualization had two qualifications. So one, like um, it looked at it as a national law or policy that is a national legal framework. And number two, from the database that I got it, all the laws that were there had a relation to climate, climate change, whether implicitly or explicitly. That was qualification number one. 
Qualification number two was because that database has the laws and policies disaggregated in different seg uh, segments, whether energy demand, energy supply, red plus, etc. So I looked at the energy supply one. So for those two qualifications, uh, we could get a strong approximation. Not a perfect fit, but a very strong approximation uh, to the hypothesis. And secondly, the peculiar thing about ODA was very interesting because one of the very strong arguments in literature is that the reforms are a very cheap economic tool or rather low cost economic tool like you remove the subsidies from maybe especially for developing countries you remove the subsidy from oil and you invest in more pressing needs like education health etc but if someone else is paying for that why should you and uh, secondly so that means like when you get overseas development assistance to pay for health to pay for education there's little incentive to take that money from uh, fossil fuel subsidies uh, and put it there and i think uh, secondly as well reforms are a very political thing and they're very much linked as well to the political cycle cycles so most of the time uh, and i think it was rightly said so the reforms are not especially for like climate change related things but they're more political in nature for example the politicians will have low cost uh, energy which is better for them especially for their election prospects so for me that was my tentative argument but i'm very much open to better arguments as to that peculiar finding thank, thank you. you very much kennedy and i think i would encourage everybody um it is an academic conference and part of that is about peer review and learning so please speak to the panelists and talk to them about um their papers and help share ideas. I'm just going to say very quickly to wrap this up that yesterday we found it really hard to get to the pub that you'd organised for us to go and have a drink at before this uh, conference because they were they were filming Transformers and uh, they were filming it here in Oxford and when I was a kid it was robots in disguise, Transformers, robots in disguise. Now pr production subsidies are a bit like those Transformer robots if you can find them and if you can identify them and you don't really know their impact from looking at them on the outside, you really have to sort of get under the hub to figure them out and to work out what reserves they unlock uh, upstream and how to undo them. So like Transformers, we also know we've heard here today, there are goodies and there are baddies as well. And some producers' subsidies are much worse than others, especially the ones up front that Iveta talked about. But not all producer subsidies are bad. And you know, this is what you, you raised as well about subsidies for solar and renewables and so on. So that's exactly what our panelists have helped us to understand today get to understand these transformer producer subsidies. They start right at the beginning of the energy chain and help us to understand how we can beat them and how we can change them. So let's, let's uh, really thank the panellists in a traditional manner.